Welcome everyone to the Cosmos community, Cosmos SDK community call. Um, today, I want to give some, a quick um, quarterly update of our Q1 deliverables and how we did on them. Um, uh, Gavin wants to um, give a quick shout out to ICS20 and trying to standardize around the memo field um, for cross-chain swaps that Osmosis and Axel are doing. And then after that, uh, MechTech will also talk about their builder um, uh, builder solution. So I'm going to share my screen. How do I share? I'm going to just go with the entire screen. Make sure the right screen is showing. Um, so I'm going to go through the roadmap um that is in the repo and give an update on everything that has been achieved so there's a differentiation between um the stretch goals and the goals and i'll briefly touch on those so starting out with the storage section so we actually produced a, a, a rfc adr on the new store design there was a storage working group um, it was led by Bez. Um, we had a lot of contributors from Vulcanize, Crypto.com, Osmosis, and many more contributing to a new design of the storage package. Um, in the meantime, we also spun out the store into its own Go module so it can evolve separately from the SDK versioning scheme. Sorry, um, Sorry, can, yeah. you, can you just zoom in? Yeah. I think it's just a bit hard for everyone to see. There we go. Thank you. That better? Yeah, that's much better. Um, and so uh, we were trying to get started on the Store V2 implementation. Um, but in the meantime, the uh, this was a kind of a stretch goal because this was uh, beginning the implementation was dependent on the timeline of Comet uh, giving an alpha tag for ABC 2.0. They were able to give us an alpha tag um, right around the time we finished the RFC. And so Bez has been also working on implementing ABC 2.0. And so once we complete that, um, then we will uh, begin the next release process. So the next release is Eden. Um, it's the first release that will have many Go modules. Um, we did a bit of exploration in parallel execution of state. Um, we weren't able to produce an RFC ADR. This was kind of a stretch goal that we wanted to um, do in terms of research. Optimistic execution. Um, the RFC ADR is um, not written yet, but we uh, read a lot of the work from the SAID team and want to um, like upstream some of their changes and also adjust some of their changes in order to um, get optimistic execution into the SDK. Um, if you have any questions on what anything is, please just give a shout out and I'll explain it. Um, so we also released V1 of Auto CLI. So Auto CLI is um, the tool that you'll be able to avoid writing CLI commands um, in the future, and everything will be auto-generated for you um, via the auto CLI and gRPC reflection. For dynamic metadata support, we completed, like I would say, like 50 to 70% of it. The one thing that we're missing is documentation around uh, amino annotations. So what does this mean? This means that basically right now, if you go look at the SDK codex, in there, you always see this register legacy amino codec. And the goal here was actually that we can get rid of the registration of the amino global. And we were able to achieve this, and we're still doing some plumbing of it. But to achieve dynamic metadata support, we were looking at how to make the migration easier for users. And the easiest way that we identified is that we can um, that we can document um, and specify how to um, how to do the migration and specify what the amino naming conventions are and the annotations that were added. Um, we added a multi-chain command, so this is Hubble. Um, so actually, you can work you can use Hubble today, um, and Hubble will you'll basically say Hubble init the chain name. It will go to the chain registry, grab a gRPC endpoint, and then look at that gRPC endpoint and generate the queries and transaction commands that you'll be able to execute against that chain. In, so 
when you're doing it against an existing chain, it's going to default, it's going to uh, fall back to the basic version of the gRPC command. So it's a bit, it's like less, a bit less user friendly. But as chains and modules add a config file on how they want their commands to be specified via Hubble, then this will get a lot nicer. We're able to also add uh, um, T uh, auto CLI transaction support. So Right, so we added transaction support and we added a um, multitude of other supports to auto CLI. Right now, um, we are working on plumbing transaction signing into Hubble. So you'll be able to use one command line for the entire interchain ecosystem. Um, and so that's kind of uh, exciting instead of having to have 20 binaries on your local machine. Um, we started consensus key rotation. So consensus key rotation, um, it's open PR, it's in the review phase and but we weren't able to merge it in q1 and so the review is ongoing right now so release collections v1 so the release of collections v1 um it's actually going to be v0.1 because we are waiting on a Golang um feature to release v1 but what we did do in the meantime is we actually uh, migrated i believe three modules to collections so bank is migrated um, consensus is migrated, I believe, one more module. And this actually, like the, the module that I migrated to consensus, it went from like three files of writing um, the module to just one file. And so you're able to really reduce the amount of boilerplate inside of a module. ORM v1, um, this, has, this also has just like one PR that's open right now, um, and it's auto query support. But the reason why we are using, the SD, using collections in the SDK is collections does not require a state migration. ORM would require a state migration, but we will be supporting both. So as an, as an application developer, you'll be able to use ORM or collections. Um, sign mode textual. Sign mode textual is completed, and now we are um, waiting for an audit that will happen, I believe, mid-May, end of May, with the Zelic team. And then we will um, be able to do the final release of that. But the next release will already have the components to plug Sign Mode Textual in. It just won't be plugged in unless you want to take the chances before it is fully audited. Core API, Core API, we merged a lot of, I, I believe this is actually, um, this should actually be checked. Um, we merged a lot of the, um, core API stuff, we've actually begun migrating modules. We've migrated um, well over three modules to using the core API. There's still components that we're still working on. Um, but what this really does is it defines a interface for what, how modules can implement without um, having to depend on the SDK. And so this really works on breaking the dependency graph between modules and the Cosmos SDK. Uh, we weren't able to complete MetaMask signing. Um, this is primarily because we were blocked and focused on getting sign mode textual ready for an audit. Um, but this is also part of our Q2 um, deliverables, and so we'll be working on that as well. ADR33 and ADR54, these guys are interesting. Within ADR33, it defines an internal messaging um, component where modules will communicate with each other via messages instead of direct keeper calls. Um, this was really tied into ADR54, and as we dove deeper, um, we discovered uh, there are there's like some other components that we'd like to include in this, and so we completed that. We closed on the ADR54 um, work uh, working group um, and completed that, and then we are now working on the ADR33. But it evolved into many other things, and we're trying to define what the future looks like um, instead of just like implementing this and building more tech debt. Um, removal of global back 32. So there's a few globals in the SDK. Primarily back 32 is one of the biggest ones. And why, why do we want to remove this as a global? Well, first of all, clients and relayers want to be able to use um, the back 32 client implementation. And to do this, they need to be able to change the back 32 encoding. And so removing that as a global will do two things. It will be able to tie the back 32 encoding to the current auth module, meaning that if you want to use something else like base 58, you'll be able to just fork or rewrite the auth module in whatever you'd like, and then you'll be able to use back 32. Now, the next thing is actually a, a misspelling. It should be an account module. So what is the account module? Right now, um, the account module has an open, uh, open ADR, open RFC, and these, there is a demo and partial implementation of the module. What does this do? It's basically account abstractions in the SDK, meaning that account 
uh, is more of an identifier and it has an identifier and an authority. And so that what the authority is, is you as your public key. So in today's world, like many of you probably have like 10, 15 different uh, private keys for 10, 15 different wallets. But like one immediate example is, okay, what if we can have like a single private key that can sign on behalf of 20 accounts? Um, this will also be able to, uh, applications will be able to define their own account models, so their own nesting accounts, um, their own uh, multi-sig style, and their own like module accounts, community pools, everything is, it's fully extendable. And so the auth, the accounts module is more of a base layer with these things we are dubbing micro modules can be plugged into. Um, we completed the design of a testing framework for in the integration testing. Um, the goal of this is to be able to canonicalize how we write integration tests. As you've seen, and if you're an application developer in the Cosmos SD, in the Cosmos ecosystem, there's many ways to write tests, and we're trying to canonicalize and define when you should use which testing style and what the testing style is, so it's a bit easier for developers to onboard and write tests. Um, this is also completed. So we ADR, ADR for ABCI 2.0 was written and merged. Um, we worked closely with the Comet team here, and we uh, DYDX and a few other teams uh, gave us really good feedback, and we were able to merge the ADR. Now the ABCI 2.0 integration has already started. Um, Bez just marked the PR as ready for review, and it's going to be a feature branch. So over the next few weeks, we'll be completing that. Uh, integration and begin our QA process for the next release. Um, circuit breaker, circuit breaker. Ooh. Circuit breaker is a module that basically acts as a um, as a circuit breaker. Like if something goes wrong, break the glass and turn the functionality off. And so what this really does is, if there's a hack going on on chain, you don't want to be, you don't have to halt your chain. You want to just be able to stop your chain, uh, to stop the message um, from being executed. Um, this was written and it's in the review phase, and we're getting ready to merge it and then cut the releases. As for IVL, um, we 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 did a huge node key refactoring. Um, of uh, IVL, so first of all, it's going to be a lot more performant, and orphans are gone, and so the overall state size of IVL will go down um, in general. Um, we worked on a migration path and came up with two, uh, two to three migration paths that are currently being implemented, and we hoped to, we weren't able to test it on mainnet. That was a very like stretch goal, but uh, we should have uh, a testnet running with IVL we'll, where we'll be doing profiles and benchmarks, benchmarking pretty soon. Does anyone have any questions on the items I just went over? You guys can still hear me, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, awesome. That's everything from there. And then in Q2, I still have to update the roadmap doc in Q2. And I'll go over that in the next community call. And then we can, we can see who wants to help out, who wants to help us out, and work together on achieving the Q2 of Cosmos SDK. Um, Gavin, do you want to talk about the ICS, ICS20 memo standard for cross-chain swaps? Sure, thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm coming kind of as an emissary from the Nomada Anoma people. Um, my understanding is that um, is that the Osmosis team and the Axelar team uh, collaborated to work on this um, cross-chain swap um, standard using um, an ICS-20 um, memo, um, a memo standard that, um, you know, if I guess the idea here is that if, if anyone working on the SDK, using the SDK rather, um, if, if we can start to agree on this as a standard, this proposed standard that uh, Nomada can support shielded actions just by default, like automatically, basically. Um, yeah, so shielded, shield, um, shielding and shielded actions. Awesome, yeah, that's definitely super cool and getting more of, um... ZK and just privacy in Cosmos is going to be super important. Um, any questions on that? Um, also, 
we have Dave here. So Dave, if you want to add on to anything there. Um, no, I mean, uh, I guess for standardizing it, uh, like there's a cross-chain swap for, for osmosis, but really you just need the memo field. Like, but what's more important is the, uh, just how do you parse uh, that you want to do a cosmos and contract call and pack a board middleware from a packet. Um, and this, if those two get in every chain, then like you have a you have some serious floodgates of uh, interchain composability, where you just upload a contract, and then you can do whatever you want from Nomada uh, or as a shield custody. Uh, yeah, like do shield actions from Nomada. So, so you're saying that every every chain needs to add the packet forward middleware now. Every chain should have packet forward middleware. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's just like a very simple. Uh, example app for showing how to integrate awesome awesome definitely agree um sweet um, and, and we were like if is this the best place are, are there other places and other doors that i should knock on if you know i wanted to you know get the word out that this might be a valuable thing for you know i, I think this is a really good place especially we're going to like post it and like write a write a thread about it um I also think that uh, I think the IPC team is also working on a community call like this or revamping their existing call. So that would also be a good a good place because that would also involve um, chains that uh, like chains that are not like um, Osmos SDK chains, let's say. Um, and so we can get a, you can get a wider reach. But I'll also share. I'm not sure if anyone from the IPC team is here. But I'll also share this with them, and then they can also potentially invite you to that call as well. That would be great. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Dave. I think so, we just tell people there's a Dragonberry level like <laughs> thing that needs to be patched, and that's how we get everyone to uh, upgrade. And then the, 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 the fix is upgrading to Packet Forward Middleware. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the best way to do it. Scare everyone. Um, Sweet. Then the last thing on the agenda um, is the talk from Mechatech about their builder solution. Um, Sean, are you speaking or is someone else? I'll speak. Awesome. Can I present as well? I have of like course. some slides here. Yeah. OK. How's that? Can anyone see that? Yeah, thanks, Marco. I'm uh, Sean from Mechatech, and we have been working in sort of off-chain builders previously and are now looking to sort of like internalize the role of the builder with a Cosmos SDK module, which used to be called X slash builder, but we renamed it X slash MEV based on feedback that we got in the ADR. So I don't think it has to be very long, but we are going to talk about a, a couple things today. So we're going to talk a little bit about what are our motivation? Why did we create this thing? We're going to sort of try and address why we think it could or should be a standard. Then we're going to describe uh, or why we need a standard in general. And uh, what is the module? How do I use it? How does it work? Comparison to existing solutions. And then we're going to talk about what next steps Mechatech sees moving forward. Cool. Okay. So MEV has become like a component of a chain's overall fiscal policies. I think uh, most Cosmos SDK chains that exist now are looking to address it, either with Skip or Mechatech or alternative solutions. Um, Rollups are very concerned, as in how are we going to incentivize um, validators to keep running the network? How are we going to pay for costs? MEV is broadly in that uh, conversation, and so. We think it needs to be um, addressed, and I think we need to. The Cosmos SDK should provide tools, right, for chains to address this concern. So that's our our main motivation for bringing this as a model. Why do we think it should be a standard? Or the argument that we made, sort of in the PR, is because what we wanted to create is like a sort of unopinionated, unopinionated shelling point for collaboration, so that if there was a point where there was contention or disagreements that there'd be a place to resolve these contentions and that it would evolve. Obviously, any solution is going to change. The question is like, what is the path for it to evolve? And we thought that having a common sort of credibly, credibly neutral 
module in a credible neutral framework made sense. And we also thought that um, it would it would minimize friction to adoption. So if it was something that you could just turn on or off, right, customize, use it or not, um, it would uh, it provide like a really good out of box experience for a bunch of chains that don't exist yet. And that's what we're looking for. Okay. So what is what is the module in general? It's uh, a framework within Cosmos SDK, so it operates as a as module and allows you to do two things, which allows you to uh, define what kind of MVB you want to capture and then define how you want to distribute it. So it's opt-in, I mean, you can check it's off by default, or you can turn it on, you can turn it on as a chain, or you can turn it on as a validator. So not all chains have to run it, not all validators have to run it, but when they do run it, they could run sort of a customized version of it, which gives you these hooks into the module of how um, what kind of blocks, what is the shape of the block that you want? Two shapes would be like front run protection or um, OFAC compliance. Those would be two preferences that the chain would want to uh, express and have respected. And then the second one is like the payment distribution, which is do you want to just like for the payments that come through MBV, do you want to burn it? Do you want to send it to the community pool? Or do you want to um, just send it to distribute it as any other reward, which is actually the default, which is mostly go to stakers and then the per validated permission. So those are the broadly two things the module does. How do I use it? Um, you just wire it up like any other module. And then in your app.go, you have a couple of configurations. And these co configurations allow you to find um, a prefix. So if you don't want to sell top of block, but something underneath it, so you the state machine has like some critical functions that it absolutely wants at the top, no matter what, then um, you can define a function that sort of classifies those, um, those, those transactions. The auction func um, allows you to specify how um, transaction or how bids are valued. So is it max price? How do you break ties? Is there some kind of like social welfare function that is custom to the chain? Um, all of that would be embedded in the auction func. And then the last thing is the, uh, the preference function, which specifies like on a per chain basis, um, how do you want to shape the block? Obviously, you need access to like this, not just the state machine, but like the body of the transaction, which is very specific to express certain preferences like front run protection. You actually need to be able to read what the message type is. Um, so the preference allows you to, on a per chain basis, provide those kind of hooks to express those kind of preferences over how the block is shaped. They're of course uh, optional. I think the default prefix is none. The auction funds I think is max bid and preferences is default. Okay, so how does it work? So similar to how like off chain um, builders used to work in the past, it kind of puts that on the proposer with a little bit of accountability. So the, when the proposer's turn to build a block, it kind of calls out to a bunch of uh, off-chain actors like searchers to say, hey, do you want top of block or not? It receives a bunch of bids, and then the proposer is responsible for choosing one or none. None is fine. But if it chooses one, it creates what we're calling a commitment which it sends to that searcher, right? And then the searcher is essentially incentivized to reveal the body of the bundle or the transaction that it wants. So like bid first, but only reveal once you have some kind of commitment from the proposer. And then the idea is that um, if the proposer equivocates or like doesn't propose the block with the thing it committed to doing, the searcher is then incentivized to, to release that evidence. Now, what do you do with that evidence? Uh, it's up to the chain. So the chain could use that evidence in a payment distribution. So one idea would be to essentially delay payments to the proposer until you've collected evidence that they did the right thing. So having some kind of fraud proof type system where you could, after the fact, sort of accumulate evidence and decide who should get paid what. So you can either withhold payments, you can potentially slash, it's really up to the chain. The point of the module is it just gives you the facility to sort of collect that evidence. So after, oh, I sort of skipped a step, sorry. One, two, three, four. So before five is four. So the proposer constructs the block, 
but this is very important. The validators actually approve it, right? So it's not up to the proposer to fully define the structure of the block. It has to adhere to these filters, like the preferences that are defined in the state machine. So if the state machine in general doesn't allow front running, it doesn't matter if the proposer, you know, tries to. It will be it will be blocked. The result is the um, the proposal will be rejected, and um, the consensus will move on to the next round, where another proposal will get another chance of running another auction. Any questions before I move on? I'll just make a little bit of space for clarification because there's like a lot of stuff on the screen. No, all good. Okay. So there's like a growing field of solutions here, and I want to share our understanding of them, which of course there are some question marks with people from the skip team that can sort of clarify here. But what's very important is the difference between PBS in the Ethereum model and what we tried to do um, in this X slash MVV module. So on Ethereum, where you have MEV boost, and um, I guess it's a an infrastructure project that went live like with the merge and has is constantly evolving based on feedback from the community and uh, hacks that are happening on the proposal level. But in general, it does full block construction. So it completely outsources what the block is. And so the state machine doesn't express any preference over the shape of the block. It kind of leaves that to either builders or, um, or relays. In excess MEV, it's, it's partial block, which is beneficial because you don't have to worry about um, some builder buying, like winning the auction, just a sensor. The proposer still has the, the ability to sort of merge in the transaction that has in this local mempool. Um, and I think that this is how X slash builder is going to work as well. But we can correct me if I'm wrong afterwards. Um, in terms of uh, input output, PBS is a pull model, and so is XMEV. Um, there are trade offs there uh, and motivations, mostly that unless without vote extension, we can't really um, do in protocol bidding. So we have to do this simplified mechanism of just pulling from the um, trusting the proposer in some respects to um, conduct the protocol correctly. Um, in XS Builder, uh, okay, I'll address that later, Dave. Thank you. So uh, XS Builder is a push-based model which comes with the consequence that um, if they're transaction types, it means that the bids are, are in the mempool, and it means that a set of actors can act upon bids and adjust their strategy to what they see in the mempool. So the big difference between pull and push is the, the privacy of the bids, where in PBS they are, XMEV they are, in XBuilder today, in our current understanding of it, because I guess it's still evolving, they're not. Um, in terms of payment distribution and PBS, it's just a Coinbase um, contribution versus XMEV. You have the tools to define that. I assume it's going to be similar for the builder module, but the, that team can talk about that. MEV preference, as in like whether it's OFAC compliant or not. In PBS, it's about the relay. The relay decides um, how they filter the transactions. In XMEV, it's on chain. Um, in PBS, you have sort of off-chain um, monitoring of who proposes what. So you sign transactions or whatever, but it's mostly through a monitoring system versus what we try to do in XMEV is make the accountability on-chain through this evidence mechanism, such that there are on-chain processes that evolve um, to adjust to malfeasance versus, I guess, social consensus and sort of async slashing that is happening now in, uh, in Ethereum. Um, our understanding that since the X slash builder module is going to put all the bids on chain, that it doesn't have this accountability mechanism because it just trusts the protocol at that level to do it. So the main consequence of these changes is that 
the XMEV module can provide some kind of execution guarantee to the offstream actor. So it actually makes a commitment to do something versus if you have a push-based model, uh, you can't. Uh, on the other side, the benefit of a push-based a push model is that without worrying about execution guarantees, you, it just kind of fire and forget its best efforts. And that will probably work better for chains with very, very fast block time, where you don't really know uh, like what block your transaction is going to arrive in. You're just doing best effort. So those are two ways to understand the differences as, as we understand today. OK. So um, next steps. So we got like a bunch of feedback. And in general, the feedback has been, yes, we want this, but we don't know how it should be shaped and that there are competing alter alternatives, and it's too early to standardize. Um, I think there's some grounds to that, and so we're going to be sensitive to that. And um, the plan is to just launch it as a separate repo, and then people can use it as they want. Um, yes, Sunny. Oh, I just meant to, I, I meant to get the whole thumbs up, not a raise hand. So in general, this was means our, our goal, we didn't achieve our goal as in we weren't able to create the shelling point and consensus. Um, but that's what the community said. We're gonna listen and we're gonna continue to try and improve it as much as we can, just the people who want to use it do. Um, so yeah, there will be some open source code for people to either use or extend um, in, in short order. And of course, we'll be sort of open the feedback on the, the concrete artifact. I'll just read the question. The recent Ethereum hacks targeted at Flashbots showed that proposer could modify bundles built by bundles. How could MEV prevent this? So it was a bug and not outside the security model. And it, it happened because the the proposer essentially tricked the relay to revealing um, when they weren't accountable. So that there was this accountability bug. The idea of, of XSMEV is that if it happens, that it will be um, on-chain recognized so that it can fall into not just social norms, but into uh, processes that communities will, will, will develop to govern their MEV. So what does this mean in practice? In Ethereum, you have like hundreds of thousands of validators. In Cosmos, you have 150. They're known by name. Um, they have much more social capital on the line for malfeasance. And if there's on-chain evidence of it, um, we hope we suggest that that should be a significant deterrence, even if it's not a completely credible mechanism. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. That's it for me. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, um, awesome. Does anyone have questions? Um, I do feel like some people were coming. Um, so, I mean, do you want to answer Dave, Dave's question? Um, well, it's yes. kind of like the statement. Um, anti Picanto to enshrine one. Yeah, I guess. Osmosis is working on a, a competing solution, and they don't want one developed before they have a chance to compete. And so we hear you, and yeah, we we decided to not push. If the community does not want this in the SDK just just yet, we're going to listen to what the community wants. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think like uh, uh, having multiple versions out there for change to choose to create. I think standardization is more important when it's like two things that have like similar trade-offs and it's just like alternative implementations and it's like yeah okay it's obviously better for people to like standardize on one implementation when there's very little difference in outcome uh but here mm -hmm. there's, it seems between builder and xmev there's like significant like trade-offs and actual like mechanism design and features like what it does right and so i think that's where like standardization is not 
desired uh, early set over early standardization is not desired and rather you want diversity of letting different chains try different things and then whichever like you know maybe farther down the road when one is if one of them is like wave or dominant then maybe it makes sense but, but, but earlier i when, think when, when feature sets change i think you want diversity yeah i think the, the way that we saw it is like i think when we look at the trajectory for pov like in a world of which uh, we have sort of like pre-commit privacy and vote extension. I think it makes sense to move the community from a push to a pull, uh, pull to a push type system. I think given those constraints, I think that model makes a lot of sense. I think without that, this model makes sense. So what you're saying makes sense insofar as one, it may take a while to provide those two things. And two, not every chain will have them. Um, so I think it, it makes sense for them, for those two solutions to coexist, for the chains that have those facilities, which make those mechanisms make sense, versus the ones that don't. What's up, Greg? And more of a community feedback than a question. Um, as an operational person in in the space i will be very interested in the long-term supportability of whichever code wins out or if we're going to have multiple parallel implementations uh, and especially the cross compatibility across chains so i can implement it for each of the 50 something chains that are running right now uh, well, i think yeah. the, the whole concern was like we used to run these off-chain builders which i don't think made sense um from an operational standpoint, like having being in the supply line for upgrades, like as like as a as a small company, doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think both Skip and Mechatech concluded that this stuff should move on chain. Um, so I think like the the maintenance over whichever one is adopted, um, it shouldn't. It'll just be in the chains binary, so th there won't be any any any, any overhead. I, I, you're right. I'm, I'm not worried about that part, and and I really actually like these uh, proposals because they're much easier to maintain. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so right now. I'm I'm focusing on security related things. So, for example, if we want to if we want to implement new features in there, or if we need to fix security bugs, who's going to maintain that code? If it's in the SDK, if it's out of the SDK, and who has the necessary resources to do this? Yeah. Thing? That's a that's a that's a good point. Like, um, I think that what we talked about with the SDK is that we would maintain it, um, but we have to like we're doing this. This is a public good, as in like this is not a monetized module. Like this is unmonetized. This is just because we think that the ecosystem will grow in a healthy way with this thing, and that you know a rising tide rises raises all boats um so yeah that is that one benefit of it being standardized and it being like the common um one module it means that like for instance if both skip and mechatech develop businesses around this we're both incentivized to contribute to it i think that was our preference but that's not the outcome thanks uh i have one question about uh so is this an extra endpoint now that validators have to maintain? Because I know, like, for flashbots, like, because their builder is sitting in front of validators, right? It's like, and they're basically like built a private Cloudflare to deal with like all the DOS that they constantly get. But in 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 your model now, the validators are now sitting in front of the builder module. Uh, do validate like uh, how much do validators have to like prepare for like? really protect like i i think the sentry node architecture is that sufficient for these or well so this was great to, to prepare for this but this is what's great about the pull model is that it's it's specifically geared towards this case like the validator will pull it'll probably like the actual full node will probably run a some kind of reverse proxy or whatever so it doesn't like leak its ip ip, IP information but 
I mean, if there's like three or four or five searchers or whatever, or how many off-chain actors are, are registered or permitted, that's up to the chain, but it probably won't be 100. It just pulls them. So it has like, there's a, there's a fixed upper limit on the number of additional connections that the uh, proposer needs to perform, needs to maintain and perform. I see. So there's like a whitelist model for who can submit. Well, yeah. So the list of you, so to be like a builder, like to be like a citizen, right? You actually like register or it's an option. You could actually have it sent to whitelist. So you only allow people to use this module that have gone through the registration process. But just in general, there's only like three or there's, only, there's like tens of searchers per chain. Um, and I guess like realistically, polling 10, 10 people in parallel um, is probably very feasible. I don't think it's like tens of, it's like not that many connections. Got it. Yeah, validators create builders, builders don't communicate to validators. I think this is very important. I think it's very similar specific. to how the, the remote signing in Comet works as well. It's the same way, actually. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. Any other questions? Cool. Awesome. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that was definitely a good talk. Thank you, Sean, for giving the presentation. Um, glad to see everyone showing up. I mean, that is all that we had on the agenda today. Um, I mean, Robert, you also had your, like, you wanted to like display your like testing stuff. Um, do you want to save that for a different uh, week so we can have a more dedicated call on the testing? Or would you want to like just quickly show it? Is Robert here? I don't, I don't know. Um, in fact, I'm driving yeah. today, so. Oh, okay, okay. It would be, it would be good, good to like, uh, you know, plan it correctly. But next, be, next week should be. Yeah. But thanks for asking. Awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Then um, we can wrap up. I know the people here in Germany um, and potentially in the States have um, Easter weekend to prepare for. So. Um, you guys can start the holiday a bit earlier. Um, just a reminder, so on April 20th, we're going to have, I always say the name wrong, I call it Say, um, to talk about the optimizations that they've made in the SDK. Um, uh, anything else that anyone would like to add on just before we close out the call? Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Awesome, guys. Have a good weekend. Enjoy. Hopefully, you're not getting too much rain, Jack. Um, and uh, no, we're we're all done with the rain. It's just like it's it's just spring. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful now. I'm, I'm stoked about it. Out, out of the drought, out of the decade long drought, and that's yeah, beautiful. into I, I think we got 45 to 50 inches over the last four months, which is kind of wild. Um, that that only lasts one season of showers in San Francisco, <laughs> though. So. <laughs> um, are you guys out of the dark and gloomies? Oh, today is like beautiful. Today's right. so sunny. It's like Spring. I, I can't even like open the open the shade. Like, is it a bunch of people running around stripping their shirts off outside, just screaming? The the there's a lot of naked people in the parks already sunbathing. That this is this is the way I imagine Berlin spring. It's like people are <laughs> so happy that the winter's over that they're just like. Ah! <laughs> and it's wild. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah. Great. Um, awesome. Well, cheers, everybody. Great to see you guys. Catch you guys. Have a good weekend, guys. Ciao, ciao. Bye, guys. Bye.